Well, good morning. My name is Pastor Joe. I oversee high school ministries and young adult ministries and somewhat yard sale ministries to an extent. Um, if you had to deal with me yesterday, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I get the pleasure occasionally to share. I'm really excited because I get to continue on with the um, identity series um, uh, that Paul has continued. He's been doing an amazing job, and I'm just uh, thankful to be a part of it and talking about our relationship with the Creator and our identities and purposeness and, and all those things. I think identity is such an important thing that we deal with because we will consistently deal with identity throughout life. You go, okay, um, when you know, you're in high school and you're like, well, who am I? I won't really know until I get out of high school. And then you're like, well, I won't know. And then you get married and you're like, what's my identity? We're always piecing through these things. But there's some under underlying identity things we we need to consistently wrestle with and continually give it to God. And so when we as a staff got together, um, one of the things I thought was really interesting tied to identity is actually how we process the past. Is how we process the past. Because every sing- how many of you have a past? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a bunch of people who spontaneously combusted this morning. Because last I checked, if you have lived, you have a past, good and bad. I didn't say bad past. I didn't say good past. I just said a past. And what's interesting is this. If we go, okay, we all have a past. Whether you like it or not, a good past can bring about good things, but also can bring about bad things. You can go, hey, you wouldn't believe what I have accomplished. I'm a really good at all these things. Congratulations, you have pride. Good past. Or maybe you went through some really big hardships and you're like, man, I'm just wounded. I'm hurt. I, it, whether your, your, your past is good or bad, it creates different things in us. And I, I think that ties more to identity than ever. And this is the premise I have this morning. We allow our past to overly define our identity. So this is the premise. I thought it was on the screen. Petra, there we go. Premise, we allow our past to overly define our identity. So we're going to piece through that this morning. And you go, hey, listen, I'm 70 years old. Whether you like it or not, your past has affected you. And maybe you're 18 years old. You might be living in defined moments that are going to help you think through what you th- who you think you are. Well, you wouldn't believe what I've gone through. That's you're defining who you are. And we're going to get into some things like that. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to delve into Luke 842. So you can open up to that. Um, But you know the premise of roughly where we are going. And we'll sort through that. Luke 842. Give you a second. Okay, here we go. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Everybody say 12 years. That's a long time. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. That's what we're going to reflect on, this story. It's an amazing story. But what's interesting is, is this is a tough story to actually kind of really look at. And so it's really interesting because we see that she's dealt a really terrible hand, 12 years. And so point number one, pasts happen. Pasts happen. Choice or not, good and bad, pasts happen. Whether you have amazing experiences, the past happens. Whether you had really terrible experiences, it does happen. And whether you chose it or whether you didn't, you're going to go through those tough things. And I will tell you this, that sometimes how we deal with it is how we see and work through that. It can shape us. You can say, well, you wouldn't believe what I've gone through. And that's why I act the way I act. Well, I know people have gone through terrible things who have actually came out 
swimmingly, like doing really well. But I also know people who have not gone through very much that are doing terrible. And ministering to a lot of youth, I, can, I cannot tell you what the family is like based on the kid. Sometimes I look at a kid, I go, oh my goodness, he's a snot. What is the family like? And they're amazing. How did this, what happened? He's making some choices. And then over here, I can look at a, and, and go, man, that, that family's really struggling, going through hard things, and the kid's amazing. We have some choice in the matter of how we respond to some of the things that are thrown at us. But no matter what, we all have a past. And, it has, and that past has huge impacts on the way we view ourselves. Like I said, some of this is going to be personal choice. Maybe it was inflicted on you. If it was inflicted on you, I'm sorry. I really am. But I will say, we live in a fallen world where crappy people make crappy decisions. None of us come out unscathed. You know the saying, don't take life too seriously because you'll never make it out alive. Right? We're all going to die. I'd rather die for his cause than my cause. Right, we're, we're not going to make it. Last I checked, I'm not going to live forever. None of us are going to make it. So the question is, is how are you going to process this world and what we deal with and what are we ultimately fighting for? But no, we're not going to make it out. And you look at this woman, she had a past. What was it? She was bleeding for 12 years. That was difficult. And do you understand bleeding? She was considered unclean. Do you guys understand what that means? She's ceremonial, unclean, untouchable. Can you imagine walking throughout your city and people going, oh, nope, I'm over here. You stay in that corner. You don't go near us. You can't do this. You're ceremonially unclean. You don't get to participate the way we get to participate. You don't get to be near us. Can you imagine how she was treated for 12 years, the wounds she must carry, the issues? You think it was easy like, I, to forget that? That was a tough season to be untouchable and dirty. And then you look at our wounds, our hardships. And we feel some of those same emotions, those same feelings. And how people treated us maybe in the middle of that. Or maybe the way we treated ourselves. But we have to acknowledge that those moments happen. We have to acknowledge that, that timing happened. Number two. Is this mic dying? Is it dying? Oh, okay. Okay. Number two, if your past still controls you, then it isn't your past. If your past still controls you, then it isn't your past. This is a huge deal. What's interesting, Jesus says something really crucial at the end of the story. He says, go in peace. Go in peace, not go and dwell about the last 12 years, not go and be angry. He calls her to move forward. Not that she didn't deal with the 12 years. It wasn't erased, but he told her to go in peace moving forward. Do we actually go in peace moving forward out of the things that we go through? No, we're like, oh, do you understand how people treated me? Is this mic dying? I don't know. Should I grab a different mic? This one? I can grab this one. It's dying. moment where he says go in peace I hate to say that that's not how we as a society think you want to know why do you understand how they treated me for the last 12 years do you understand what I went through do you understand me 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 that's the way we see we would hold around grudges we'd walk around with a vengeance holding things I remember what you did to me and then that slowly becomes a part of who we are, how we define ourselves. Going, hey, no, do you, I'm the person. I went through that. 
And because of that, that's the way I act, the way I act. That's why sometimes I don't get along with that, those group of people. Like, that's what we do. We define ourselves based on that. But Jesus wanted so much more for her. He goes, no, go in peace. Guys, guess what? We don't make peace. We're not the peacemakers. Ultimately, Jesus is the peacemaker. What he's saying is go with me. Lean on me for understanding. So how much of the way that you live your life is based on the past? I would ask you that now. Are you even aware of the, all the little things in you that go, that's just a part of who I am? That's just who I am. And I'll go, I don't know if that's how God created you to be. That's based on your past and your history and how that affects now. And I don't even think most of us fathom all the ways at which our past control how we view and identify ourselves. I don't think we truly fathom it. Um, I'm going to be transparent up here. I, I have my fair share of issues, things that I would say, well, that's just who I am. And one of those unique things about me is I don't like to walk by myself down the road. I don't. I actually don't like to be alone very much. But especially if I'm walking in public, I don't like that. To the point that Leslie will go, okay, if we're shopping, she'll go, I'm going to go down here and go here. I'm like, I definitely don't want to go there. Um, why don't you meet me down over here? I'm like, nah, I'll just go sit in the car. Or I'll just go do this. And I, I really had to self-analyze the things that I do. Well, I just don't like to be alone on the road. But why? Is that because that's just how God created me? Or is there something, and I had to actually define and sort into my past to go, why am I doing this? Why am I treating my wife this way? Why am I, like, what if God said, no, I want you to do this? I'm like, well, I'm still not comfortable with it. That's fine. So I started sorting through this, and I have this memory I was seven years old, and we lived at the end of a cul-de-sac, and you, uh, you could go to the end of the cul-de-sac, there was a road, and then there was about a 500-yard hill over the hill. You couldn't see, but on the other side, there was a road in my, middle, my elementary school. And I remember um, I would walk to school. My parents could see me, for the most part, all the way up and over the hill. It was decently safe. And I'll never forget, I was walking, and I kind of looked back, and I saw this orange Bronco drive by. And I, I remember orange because orange is one of my favorite colors. And I was like, oh, that's a cool car. Kept walking up the hill. Kind of just turned. Here comes the orange Bronco in the other direction. That's weird. Okay. Walking up the hill. Turn around. Orange Bronco drives by again. Pulls over. And the guy gets out and starts running at me. I don't know anything. I'm seven, and I book it over the hill as fast as I can. I was almost at the top. I run, and I make it to the school out of breath. I never walked again for the rest of my life to school. And I'm sitting here going, what, is he going to take me? All these emotions and feelings that I had in that moment. But you know that there's still a part of that in me when I am walking down the main street of Kalispell. And how ridiculous that is that I think in my head a van's going to pull up and take me. It's funny when you think it is. <laughs> Guys, like, come on. Like, join me in this for a second, okay? If you were going to make a list of people that were going to be abducted, this isn't in the list. <laughs> good luck. I hope you got six guys. Try. All I got to do is go, good luck, and just fall and catch me. <laughs> like, it's not going to happen. This is not realistic. It's a false sense of identity that I've declared on myself that's not realistic based on my past that's controlling me now. Good luck. But so how real it is to me in the moment that I actually haven't sorted through it. That all of a sudden my past in this situation, I don't know, maybe the guy knew me. I wasn't staying around to find out when I was seven. I don't know. But on the flip side, it created a thing in me that goes, me and my identity, I'm not going to live that way. To the point that I believe there's been times in my life where it stopped me from fulfilling that which God has called me to do. Why? God goes, I want you to go here. i got to walk. Nope, not by myself. Ain't going to do it. And God goes, really? I have things for you to do. But we set up our little things around us that prevent us 
from fully living the way God has called us to. It overly now defined me. Number three, your past shouldn't define you, but rather refine you. There's a huge difference between a definite, defining and refining. To define is to de- determine or identify the essential qualities or meaning of. Like, this is exactly who you are. This is why you've been created. This is your meaning. Or to refine is to free from impurities or unwanted material. We are in a hard place, in a hard world, where God has called us. We, we have to be refined. I don't know about you. I'm full of some unwanted materials. And I don't know how God's going to remove them. And maybe it's through the, sh- the sifting of the world. But there's some refining that needs to happen. But the problem is I allow my past to define me, not refine me. See, we're not called to throw the past away, but on the flip side, maybe you're the one that says, hey, I made some horrible choices. God forgave me, but man, I still stink. I'm going to pause for a moment just to dwell on that. You want to know why? What right do you have to hold it against yourself in the light of repentance before the Lord? If you're going, hey, but I can still hold it against myself. Even though God hasn't and he's forgiven you, what you're saying is your opinion is greater than God's, which actually goes into a bigger idea still tied to identity. There's a point where you still need to move on. But you go, okay, well, what, let's go back to this refining, defining thing. You look at the, the issue, go, okay, well, the harm. Maybe, maybe the things that I still need to seek forgiveness. Maybe you've never ultimately gone before the Lord. But the key is you have to move forward. And the past shouldn't move forward with you. It should be filtered to be allowed. The things that grasp, that refine you. See, Scripture talks all the time about moving forward into something new, into something new. Philippians 3, 13 through 14 says this. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's some such cool words in this, guys. Straining forward. I don't know about you, but straining really goes to refining. I don't know about you, but pressing forward. It's a little bit of pressure. Those are pressure points. Those are things that are not always easy, but it's a growth point moving forward. And and Paul's writing, hey, you got to move forward. Straining forward. That means it's not always easy to press Guys, I don't know about you, but pressing is not an easy thing. To press grapes, to do those kinds of things, it's applying a little bit of pressure. And I don't know about you, but the things that we go through create that pressure in us. And then what more are we called to do with it? We're called to refine ourselves to truly who God has called us to be. To move on from the past, straining forward, pressing on. That's refining at its core. Not to dwell, but grow forward. And I'll tell you, if you go, well, it still hurts, then it's still very current. It's still very current. But I'm going to have wounds. Hopefully they will heal. And what's crazy is, is wounds create scars. Scars are actually like a welding of skin where it actually is tougher. I don't know if you guys have scars. I got a fair amount of scars on my arm, but it's actually tougher skin because it's kind of like reforged itself together. Do you guys know that scars don't collect dust or dirt? Yeah. It it, it can't stick the same way. It doesn't have the same properties. So all this stuff, you kind of go and you piece through it, and you go back to going, okay, so our passion define us, rather refine us, and we have to understand that we're going to be scarred and we're going to go through hardships, but on the flip side, the world is going to go, hey, listen, don't, don't get scars or allow the wound to be open. And you're like, well, I need to piece through this and then learn how to give God the glory through whatever it is I went through. Which goes into really easily number four. We see our identity based on the relativity of self-worth. 
We see our identity based on the relativity of self-worth. Here's what it means. Relativity means relative to something. So here we go. Okay, well, I'm going to define who I am based on something relative. It's my opinion based on what? Based on the way I see the world. Well, I see the world based on what I've been through. That, that's what we really do. So we see our identity based on how I fit into this world and how people have treated me. That's really what it comes down to. So can you honestly say that you have a clean view of yourself? Can you step out of yourself enough to say you have a clean view of yourself? I can't. Because I think we all have a little bit of ba uh, a bias. We're all a little biased. Now, that could be good bias or bad bias. Why? Because either I think pretty good of myself or I'm trash. I mean, it's kind of a lose-lose in some scenario. We don't have a good relative understanding. We see ourselves as products of the past. And these are just who we are. And I will tell you this. If we are defining ourselves, this will be seen as a clear untruth. Because if we are defining ourselves, it's what we call a false identity. Um, Matt uh, Pavlik writes this, Your false identity is the opposite of your true identity. Whatever is outside of God's intentional design is false. The problem is our false identities are birthed out of life's circumstances, hardships, personal decisions, and self-concepts from the moment in time. All the things that we've gone through, we use to define ourselves. And in 20, 30 years, or maybe where you're at now, you're going to find yourself not walking down the street by yourself. And God goes, this is not what I had for you. I had such greater for you. Why are you defining yourself as this? Now let's go back to the bleeding woman. What's interesting is in this story, guys, she's still being referred to as the bleeding woman. Like, to me, I'm like, I feel bad. Why is she, like, the bleeding, we can't call her Beth? Like, how come we don't know her name? She's being identified based on that. But there's something so cool I don't want to miss in the middle of the story. There's healing. There's redemption. And God goes, hey, go in peace. We talked through that. You are not your past. You're not your mistakes. You're not your wounds. And Jesus does something amazing in the middle of the story. He calls her daughter. And Paul hit this so good a few weeks ago. He goes, listen, you have to understand your identity first in Christ as a son and daughter of the Lord. And I'm going to say one of the key ways to move past some of the healing of the hardships that you've endured and things you've gone through is to remember who your identity and who you're tied to first and foremost as a son and daughter of the living God. And if we don't live in that, you're right. You are going to look at yourself more and go, woe is me for all that I've gone through. That's what, that's what Satan wants. He wants you to say, hey, you went through this. Look at yourself. God goes, no, you went through that. Look at me as my daughter, as my son. And we forget that. Do we remember our identity tied to God first and foremost? And that is going to change the way we look at our pasts. So maybe you're sitting here, you're going, hey, I've been hurt. I've, I, terrible things that have gone to me. And honestly, maybe you might point fingers at the Lord. God only wants the glory out of it, not the glory. He, I, he didn't necessarily make it happen. We have to understand that. One of the biggest questions I get is why do bad things happen to good people? And the simplest answer is we live in a fallen world where crappy people make crappy decisions. Well, well why would God allow that? Well, you you want to know the answer that I have best come up with in my understanding? Number one, God is love. Okay, if God is love and we believe that, love has to be a choice. Otherwise, it's not love. Love has to be a choice. So that means if love is a choice, that means there has to be an opposing force to love. That means there has to be an opposing choice, and people choose that. So why do bad things happen to good people? Because love is a choice, and we live in a world where it is a choice, and people choose the other. 
there's also just some of a chance of you never know what's going to happen. You never know how the world unfolds. I had a really good, amazing friend who was a believer named Daniel in high school, and I'll never forget. Um, I found out he passed away years ago um, at like 28 years old. And I was like, wait, he died? He was like one of the most healthy people I knew. He loved the Lord. What happened? They're like, he hit a deer, and, and literally the antlers went through the front windshield and through his heart. And it broke me. I'm like, what? Really? What? I, I don't even know how to respond to that. The one play, I, I've hit deer before. And, and what's the chance of that happening in that way, in that way, and going, man, we live in a fallen world. That's really all I can say. My heart breaks that we live in a world where circumstances like that happen. So as you sort through some of the things that you've gone through in life, I want you to remember God is love. He is choice. But I, to think they're like, be careful about blaming God. Be careful through those things. Romans 8.28 does say this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What this means is no matter what you've gone through, God is trying to do good through that. He wants the glory and he wants to make it something. Whatever you've gone through, it, when it becomes a testimony. When you've gone through a test and you get to share God's glory through it. I know people that have gone through horrible, horrific things of rape and whatnot. And now that's a testimony that they actually get to test, share the loving God through their story to what God has done in their own life. That's what we want to do with our past is allow God the power over it to move forward. And then what that's going to do is that's going to free you up to find your identity as a son and daughter first in God. It's going to give him the power over your situations. And you go, well, okay, so where do we even go from here? Well, I, I, I maybe need to apologize. This is a little bit of a counseling type sermon. But on the flip side, dealing with identity is a huge part of our inner core. I want you to know that now. And anybody that would say, I'm trying to figure out who I am. I want to deal with my identity. Anybody that would ask that question, there's going to be things that are going to poke. There's going to be things that are going to prod you a little bit, that are going to feel uncomfortable, that are going to feel convicting. I don't know. I hope so, because it's doing it in my own life. There are assessments I need to make, things that I need to change. You go, okay, so how do we move forward? Well, I think you need to assess why you do what you do and how you've defined yourself. Is that what truly what God has for you? Or are you claiming that it's just how you are? You need to unpack maybe the past a little bit. Or I would say current if you're still dealing with it and some unhealed things. Maybe seek counseling. I'm a huge proponent of counseling. I myself have had counseling even recently. I think everybody needs counseling. We're all screwed up. Amen. There was not enough amens on that. I'm the only one screwed up? I think we all need counseling. And if you don't need counseling, you might need more counseling. I don't know. Maybe you need to spend some time actually writing down truly what you feel makes you you and see if that lines up with Scripture and what God actually says about you. Maybe you need to work on forgiveness. And maybe you need to truly assess the things you've gone through and what God wants to do through it. To strain, to refine who you are. I don't know about you guys. I got a lot of work to do. This is definitely a, is it, what's the, the saying? Calling the kettle black? What's the saying? Yeah, yeah, that one. Sure, let's go with that. I, guys, I, I... I'm coming to you not sharing. I got it figured out. Trust me. I still sometimes don't walk by myself down the road. If you drive up with a van unmarked, we got issues. <laughs> but I know I got things to work on. Let's pray.